Okay, hi everybody. Um, we're moving on now to look at how the risk of flooding can be managed. Um, so think back to the first unit of work we did in year 10 about hazards. And we did a case study about the Somerset levels flooding. Um, we don't do a case study of flooding in this topic because it comes up in hazards anyway. Okay, so you can think back um, to the impacts of that flood. What were the impacts of the Somerset levels flooding in terms of um, the way that it affected people's lifestyles, it affected their homes, it affected businesses. And there was a huge economic cost um, to rebuild those areas after the flood had happened. So there's quite a lot of emphasis and quite a lot of thinking goes into how we can protect places and reduce the risk that they have from flooding. Um, and that's what we're learning about today. OK, so the title's Flood Management. And we're going to look at some examples of how the risk of flood can, floods can be managed. And these can be divided into two groups. We've got hard engineering and we've got soft engineering. So we're going to look at some examples of those. Look at the costs and the benefits, the advantages and disadvantages of each method um, and evaluate them. OK, so think about overall which sort of strategy might be better. Uh, so first of all, then hard engineering. Now, this is any type of flood management scheme which involves building a structure. So using man-made structures. OK, it's normally very expensive often in the millions of pounds. So hard engineering would be used where there's something really important that needs protecting, like a lot of housing, um, a hospital, uh, railway lines, motorways, water treatment plants, anything that really we couldn't cope with being flooded. OK, so this is very expensive. It involves building big, big structures. And there's four types of hard engineering that we need to know about. Dams, channel straightening, embankments and flood relief channels. OK, this is a dam. Well, this is the dam here, actually, this big concrete structure built here. So this used to be um, probably a V-shaped valley somewhere in the upper course of the river. OK, the valley would have come down like this and the river would have been quite narrow. Um, the valley sides quite steep. And what they've done to create this um, lake behind which is called a reservoir they've built a big tall concrete wall essentially across the valley and slowly the river has filled up behind it to create a lake so a good example here is um chew valley lake which lots of you might have been to visit um they can be really effective at managing the amount of water that goes into the river because here within the dam these little um shutters they can control how much water goes through the dam. They don't stop the river altogether. They don't want to do that, but they control how much water is in the dam. OK, so they're quite good at maintaining the flow. So if it's rained really heavily, they can keep more back. If it's not rained so much, they can let more out. OK, so they can control it. It's really effective at managing flooding further down the river because you can control quite carefully um, how much water is in the river. They're also often used for other purposes. So sometimes these dams here might be used to create hydroelectricity. As the water flows through them, they can drive a turbine. They can turn a turbine, which creates electricity. Or, much like the lake at um, Chu Valley, they can be used for recreation. So sailing, walking, bird watching, that kind of thing. They have a bit of a tourist use as well. Problems with them, really expensive, millions of pounds to build. Um, it's flooded a huge area of land behind it. May have had homes in, villages in, which would have had to have been purchased and um, people rehoused. It uh, can change the environment because that wasn't a dam and a reservoir before. There was not a lake there before, so habitats might have been lost. Um and when that flooding happens, the plants that are underneath there, the, the trees, the bushes, the vegetation that's under there starts to rot. And so you get quite a lot of methane released from the rotting vegetation, which is a greenhouse gas. So that's not good for climate change. So that's dams and reservoirs. Uh, by the way, on Show My Homework, there's this Word document for you. 
Okay, so that's this has got all of the information really that I'm talking through. Did it to write it all down furiously. Right, second method, channel straightening. This is essentially making the river straighter. Okay, cutting through the meanders to create a straight channel. And what this does is it speeds up the flow of the river from one point to another. Um, and it's most often used um, around towns and cities. They don't want the water hanging around near the town. Um, they want it kind of gone. So make the channel straighter. There's less friction because there are fewer meanders. And so the water gets um, away from the town or the city more quickly. So it's good for protecting vulnerable locations. Um, and they often line the sides as well with concrete. Looks like I've probably done that over here. Makes it smoother. Silt doesn't build up and slow the water down. Just makes it quite a fast channel. Um, problems with it, it's not necessarily the most attractive, it's quite unnatural looking, so sometimes people aren't that fond of it. Um, and what it does is it just moves the risk of flooding further on. So this place here might now be at less risk of flooding, but perhaps further down the river, outside of the town, the flood risk is probably increased because there's going to be a load of water get there and much more quickly. So that's channel straightening. Um, these are both examples of embankments. Okay, an embankment is a raised riverbank. So this is one under construction. Here you can see they're building up the side of the river. And this is what they might look like afterwards. They've built up this embankment at the side here. Um, and this is to, again, it's to increase the amount of water that the river can hold. Um, advantage of this it might have a good leisure use so you can see here this is quite a broad open path it's going to encourage people to be active uh, walking cycling jogging along the um, the riverbank path it gives good access to the river so you quite often find that um, people take part in water sports here like rowing and things like that um, it's quite expensive because of the large amount of concrete that goes into building it and it's quite unnatural looking because it's so straight. Sometimes you find that embankments and channel straightening are used together. So like here, this is a an embankment again, here where the channel's been straightened. Whoops. That's professional, isn't it? <laughs> um, here you've got this embankment that's created where the river has also been straightened. I'm trying to rest my phone on a box tonight and use two computers at the same time. It's all very technical. <laughs> Far beyond me, as you can probably imagine. Right, number four, hard engineering number four. This is called flood, a flood relief channel. Um, this is the original course of a river, quite meandering. The river here is going to travel quite slowly because there's quite a lot of friction. Um, so what they do in this sort of scenario is an extra bit of river is built here called a flood relief channel. And quite often this is built around urban areas. In fact, there's one that they've built where I live in Midsummer and Autumn. Um, there's a flood relief channel that takes some of the water away from um, the town. Now, normally... When the river's in normal flow, it's not been raining particularly heavily, like at the moment, um, this channel is where the water would, would flow through. Just keep it natural, keep it um, normal. When there's a risk of flooding, there's a set of gates here that can be opened and some of the water can be diverted through this flood relief channel. Um, and then less of it's going to go this way, reducing the risk of flooding. Um, it's quite effective because it reduces the risk of flooding. Um, it keeps this section of the river looking natural because they haven't straightened this section. And this bit could be kind of away from housing, away from parks. It might be going through an industrial area or something like that. Um, problems with it, it's quite expensive to build. Um, and if it floods really badly, actually the river and the flood relief channel might flood. Um, so you're kind of spreading out your your area that's that's at risk. So those are four methods of hard engineering. Remember, hard engineering is um, building something, building a physical man-made structure. And therefore, it's usually quite expensive because it involves a lot of concrete, a lot of um, 
engineering to build it. Soft engineering is more about working with physical or natural processes. Um, and this is about slowing down the speed with which water gets to the river in a more natural way, rather than building a structure. And these are our four examples, planting trees, floodplain zoning, river restoration and flood warnings and flood alerts. In the opposite of hard engineering, these are generally less expensive. So planting trees, um, this is called afforestation, the opposite of deforestation, planting trees. Um, and what they do is they slow down the water. When it rains, water forms on trees. It's going to be slowed down because it's intercepted by the tree's leaves. It kind of doesn't get to the ground on the river as quickly. And also trees absorb a lot of water through their roots. Um, so it slows down the amount of water that gets to the river channel and the speed with which it does so. Um, problems with this doesn't always prevent flooding, um, especially during periods of really high rainfall. It might just slow it down or make it less bad. It doesn't always prevent flooding completely. But benefits of it is relatively cheap. And there are lots of environmental benefits of planting trees. Um, so their role in countering the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, the habitat gain, the fact that they look quite nice in the environment as well. OK, so planting trees is an example of soft engineering. As is floodplain zoning. This is about restricting what can be built where. So not building a power station next to a river that's likely to flood not building a hospital next to a river that's likely to flood. OK, common sense, basically. Um, so keeping areas close to the river for lower value activities or things that can be moved. So like farmland, you can move the animals. Sports fields, you can stop using them. So keeping these kinds of activities closer to the river and then higher value things like industry, factories and housing and essential services like hospitals and schools away from rivers. Um, problems with this, it's quite hard to do on areas that have already been built up. So quite a lot of floodplains, this bit down here, have already been built on. We can't suddenly say, get rid of all those houses. OK, um, and... If you own this piece of land down here and suddenly the council says nothing can ever be built on that land, you're not going to be happy because your land is probably not going to be worth as much. But it can reduce the um, damage that floods cause. This will never stop a flood from happening. The land will still flood. It's just about reducing the damage that the flood does. So the economic cost of the flood is going to be less. There'll be fewer insurance claims. Um, you would hope there would be um, less loss of life as well in a flood because of floodplain zoning. You're not building anything, so it's not hard, hard engineering. This is an example of soft engineering. Um, as is river restoration. OK, this is the opposite of channel straightening. So if you look at this photograph, this which is now full of what looks like concrete. This is where a river had been straightened. And in this photo, they've reversed it. OK, so they've returned the river to this kind of gentle meandering river. And the idea with this is the opposite of channel straightening. It slows the river down. And it reduces the likelihood of a major flood. Now, notice there's nothing particularly high value in this photo. There are no houses, hospitals, industry and so on. It looks like a wooded area, maybe a bit of an agricultural area over here. So you wouldn't do this through a town or a city or an industrial area. Um, it restores the river back to its original form. It creates natural environments like wetlands, which are good for birds and other wildlife. Um, it's quite expensive compared to other sorts of soft engineering. So this is probably a similar cost to channel straightening because you're just doing the, the reverse. Um, 
and it doesn't always prevent flooding. If this, if there was a huge amount of rainfall in this area here in this photo, this river would still be likely to flood. But it's about thinking about a river from its source to its mouth and how all these different projects along the river itself join up a little bit. And then the last one is flood warnings and flood alerts and preparations that we can make. Now, there's an organisation called the Environment Agency, and they're part of the government. And one of the jobs that they have is to monitor rivers. So they um, have monitoring stations all along all, all major rivers. And they do things like record how much water's in the river. They look at data on how much it's rained. And they basically monitor how much water's in the river now and how that could change over the coming days. Um, and based on that they produce um, flood warnings, okay? And these are communicated to people through the TV and the radio and newspapers. And also in some areas, if you're in a flood risk area, um, you get an automatic phone call as well if you need to evacuate your um, your home, okay? So it's in um, different categories. You can have a flood alert, which means that flooding is possible. Be prepared. That's like the lowest level. A flood warning, that means flooding is expected and you need to take immediate action to protect your property, maybe moving your belongings upstairs, potentially evacuating, using sandbags or barriers to protect your house. And this one, severe flood warning, means severe flooding is going to happen and that there's a danger to life. And here they would be saying, get out. OK, so this is monitoring the rivers and telling people what's going to happen. Um, problems with this doesn't stop flooding in any way. It just tells people what's coming. Um, some people might not have access to the warnings. And even with getting automatic phone calls, OK, some people might not be in. They might not answer the phone. Um, elderly and disabled people might find it quite difficult to um, take the action that's needed. And if you have a flash flood, a flood that happens very quickly, um, these warnings might not work because people don't get told in time. Um, the benefits, it's relatively low cost and people have got an opportunity to protect their properties. So people put sandbags out um, in areas where it floods a lot. People have more than sandbags. Things like um, flood barriers are often put up around properties. Um, people can save their possessions. They can move their belongings upstairs. They can evacuate. Um, it means it's, there's less of an economic cost to the flooding. So two types of flood management. Hard engineering, building things, usually very expensive, but generally more effective at stopping or reducing the size of the flood. Soft engineering, not building something, working with more natural processes, either likely to reduce the size of the flood, not stop it, but reduce the size of the flood, or not stop it at all, but reduce the economic cost and hopefully also reduce the number of people who are um, injured or unfortunately killed in a flood. Less expensive though, soft engineering. Now, you've got this um, sheet on Show My Homework. which has timed out. There we go. You've got this sheet here. So it's got everything I've just been talking about on there, the advantages and disadvantages of, of each of those um, methods. And what you're going to do with that is you're going to um, answer um, this question. OK, it's a six mark question. It's one of those six mark questions where they give you a statement at the beginning. So the statement is hard engineering strategies are effective in managing risk, flood risk. Do you agree with this statement? So you're going to have to think about, first of all, what you think about that statement. Do you think that hard engineering strategies are effective? Do they work? Do they work in managing flood risk? OK, it's a six mark question. So you need to write two paragraphs. OK, and I would go for two um, P paragraphs. OK, so down here at the bottom, there's an example of what a paragraph might like, look like. This is one of the paragraphs about channel straightening. And what I've written, I'm going to start off by describing the strategy, so saying what channel straightening is. Then I'm evaluating it. What's 
kind of good or bad about it. And then to make it even better, I'm going to put some more evaluation in as well. OK, and trying to put the positives and the negatives. What is good about channel straightening and what are the problems with channel straightening? OK, for your answer, if you do this twice, write two P paragraphs like this, describe a hard engineering strategy, talk about whether it's what's good about it and talk about what's bad about it. Repeat that. So two paragraphs, then you're likely to be up in the, the five, six marks range with it. OK, please don't write about channel straightening because that's my answer there. OK, there's no point giving me my answer back. And yes, this is a piece of work for submission. OK, so you need to either send this to me by email or you need to submit it to me on Show My Homework. OK, any problems, um, send me an email and I'll get back to you. OK, take care, everybody. See you soon, hopefully. Bye bye.